Okay. So today we're going to have a discussion with Dr. Jeremy E. Orr of UC San Diego, and we're going to discuss anesthesia for adults with neuromuscular breathing weakness. Dr. Orr is a board certified pulmonary and critical care physician. He's an associate professor of medicine, and he specializes in hypoventilation disorders, neuromuscular respiratory weakness, chronic lung disease, non-invasive ventilation management, and critical care medicine. Not that you would, but don't use what we discussed today as a substitute for medical care. For medical care or advice related to breathing muscle weakness, seek the care of a clinician who specializes in the breathing issues of those with neuromuscular disease. And at this point, we're just going to review some of the questions from the Breathe community and I'll talk about this very critical topic. So thank you so much, Dr. Orr, for agreeing to, to talk to us about procedures that uh, may require anesthesia. And one of the first questions that, that folks tend to have on this is, really, what is the most important information um, to provide the anesthesiologist, other than telling them the individual simply has a neuromuscular disease? Yeah, well, first of all, um, Andrew, thank you very much for having me uh, here. And I really appreciate uh, the efforts that you are making to raise awareness um, in this space. And uh, I think it's really important and empowering. Um, so thanks for that. Um, well, I think, you know, what I would say about uh, surgery and for someone with neuromuscular disease is that it's obviously a, a stressful time. It's a, it's a um, thing that raises a lot of anxiety. And, um, you know, overall, I think with good planning, uh, surgery can be safe for patients with neuromuscular disease. Um, and, but the key is really planning. And so I think that's what I'd probably overall emphasize the most. Um, although it is helpful to tell an anesthesiologist, hi, I'm a person living with neuromuscular disease, um, really to effectively manage things, they're gonna need some more information. And in particular, um, you want to be able to tell them a bit more about your exact type of neuromuscular disease because that's going to change, potentially change their management. And then from a um, pulmonary standpoint, um, being able to um, give them an assessment of the severity of the respiratory muscle involvement is really crucial. And so, um, you know, that doesn't have to fall on, on the patient. Obviously, this can be something that your pulmonologist, you know, communicates ahead of time. Um, and we always recommend a preoperative visit with the pulmonologist uh, prior to really pretty much any uh, surgery that's going to require uh, sedation. Um, and during that visit, um, the pulmonologist um, will review everything, including the severity of lung function impairment, um, probably, you know, um, reasonably well captured by the vital capacity. So you're definitely going to want to make sure that you have a vital capacity measurement prior to any surgery. And um, the peak cough flow or the peak or the cough peak flow mm -hmm. is another metric um, that's uh, that can be useful to obtain prior to surgery. Okay. So what respiratory risks should one consider with regard to, to any sort of procedure that's going to require anesthesia? Right. So let's say there's sort of two main categories. Uh, one is post-operative respiratory failure. So this is the idea that the breathing after surgery can become uh, more shallow, that uh, the carbon dioxide levels can go up and oxygen levels can go down. And so someone can go from a compensated state into acute respiratory failure. So post-operative respiratory failure. And the second um, 
issue, which, you know, these aren't exclu mutually exclusive, is a post-operative infection, post-operative pneumonia is really what we worry about. And again, that's um, <clears throat> often something that can be related to anesthesia. When you get anesthesia, there's a loss of protective airway reflexes um, in a patient without neuromuscular disease. Um, that in and of itself also, you know, does carry some, some risk, but for a patient with neuromuscular disease that already had some level of impairment there, um, there may be an increased risk of aspiration, even micro aspiration, which can lead to pneumonia. And especially if uh, there's not enough airway clearance, ineffective airway clearance to help to clear out secretions, open up the lung and, uh, and prevent uh, the development of, of a pneumonia. What kinds of reactions can those with neuromuscular disease have to anesthesia? Things like malignant hyperthermia or similar events. Yeah, so um, certain patients, certain neuromuscular diseases um, can <clears throat> result in a condition called malignant hyperthermia. And uh, malignant hyperthermia is, is not um, specific per se to neuromuscular disease. Um, it can happen to even someone without a clinically apparent neuromuscular disease, but certain neuromuscular diseases have a greatly increased risk. And this is a condition where with certain anesthetic agents, particularly volatile, certain volatile or inhaled anesthetics, that a uh, person um, gets muscle rigidity and the temperature goes up uh, into a life-threatening uh, range. And it is a treatable condition, actually, if it's recognized early. There's uh, There are medications that can be given if someone develops malignant hyperthermia. And you know the anesthesiologists and the OR staff they train for this. They they're trained to recognize it. But of course, you know prevention is always way better uh, than dealing with the complications. But you know malignant hyperthermia is something to consider. Um, other reactions are uh, related to the use of neuromuscular blockade. So when someone undergoes surgery, especially general anesthesia. Um, they may be given medication to relax the muscles. And the reason that those medications are given is that, um, number one, they help with intubation or putting a breathing tube down into the windpipe if that's necessary for that type of procedure. Um, and they also are useful in terms of creating good operating conditions for a surgeon. You don't want somebody moving. And even with, with uh, sedation, people can potentially move. You don't want that to happen when someone is operating in a delicate spot. So those medications, um, again, in certain neuromuscular conditions can cause issues like high potassium. Um, and uh, that can be life-threatening. Or they can have more of just a prolonged, so they don't cause a, an acute problem when it's given, but they take a long time to wear off. And that's probably one of the more common things for a lot of neuromuscular conditions, that the medications just hang around for a lot longer mm -hmm. and um, make it harder to get somebody off of uh, the respiratory support that they're getting in the operating room. Okay. You kind of already touched on this a little bit, but what <laughs> kinds of anesthesia should be used to ensure um, the least impact to breathing for someone with NMD? Yeah, I mean, it requires a thoughtful approach, and I don't think there's an, a formula um, exactly. Um, when we talk about anesthesia, um, very broadly, there's kind of like three levels. There's light anesthesia, and that's typically, sometimes people call it anxiolysis. You know, that's maybe where they give somebody a very low dose of a, um, a benzodiazepine or a medication just to take the edge off a little bit. And uh, sometimes that's done even for you know, a CAT scan or MRI or something like that. Very light anesthesia. That is, the person's still plenty awake. Um, it's not impeding their um, breathing in a substantial way. It's not making them asleep, but, you know, it's maybe akin to having a glass of wine or something like that. Mm -hmm. A level above that is something called moderate sedation. Sometimes people call it conscious sedation. Um, there are other names, twilight. I've heard people call it twilight sedation. Um, 
these are, uh, it's a deeper level of anesthesia. And uh, it basically is kind of like putting someone to sleep. I mean, it's not really sleep, but it's making it so that someone is with their eyes closed, um, but they are continuing to breathe on their own. They're continuing to protect their airway. And if you were to kind of rub on them, they wake up. And so that's, that's moderate uh, sedation. Um, and of course, you know, that level of sedation is um, when you say that they are breathing on their own, that's what you're talking about for a person without neuromuscular disease. So that can carry um, some risk of respiratory depression in a neuromuscular patient because what normally wouldn't suppress the breathing uh, in a normal, uh, in a patient without neuromuscular disease uh, uh, certainly could in a neuromuscular patient. The other thing about moderate sedation is sometimes, you know, you're kind of giving the sedation and sometimes level the level of sedation is a little bit deeper than you were sort of going for. There isn't, you know, an exact dose of medication that you give that's going to put everybody at level of moderate sedation. Sometimes uh, they're getting actually a little bit deeper in sedation, we need to back off on the medication. So um, there isn't necessarily a bright line. Uh, the deepest level of sedation, I mean, it's called deep sedation or general anesthesia. And uh, this is where someone is totally asleep, totally unresponsive, and unable to breathe on their own. And so what that means is that the person needs breathing support. And that can be done um, with an endotracheal tube where the breathing tube is put down into the windpipe. It can be done with a, uh, what's called a laryngeal mask airway that sits above the vocal cords and, and provides breathing support. Um, it's really not commonly done with just a BiPAP or non-invasive ventilation. Um, so those are the kind of three levels of anesthesia. And as far as your original question about what is um, safest, certainly lighter anesthesia um, in terms of suppressing breathing is lower risk. The lighter the sedation, the less risk of um, suppressing breathing. But at the same time, um, you know, there's sometimes you need deeper sedation in order to safely do a surgery. And so for some, some people, or you might do something with moderate sedation in a person without neuromuscular disease, you might do, you might say, oh, there's a little bit too much risk of suppressing breathing. We're not going to try to walk that knife edge. We're just going to do this with general anesthesia so we can really make sure that the breathing is supported throughout the whole thing. So it depends a little bit. In general, I think we try to do the lightest sedation possible, but sometimes general anesthesia can actually be safer um, because you have already assumed that you need to support the breathing. Ken, we touched on this a little bit too in um, one of your, your answers about um, anesthesia medications that should be avoided um, for someone with neuromuscular disease. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't know that there is a medication that... Um, needs to be avoided 100% of the time. There is um, a, a medication, a type of neuromuscular blockade medication that's called a depolarizing mm -hmm. um, uh, medication. It's actually pretty uncommon that it's used uh, these days um, because the other medication alternatives are just as good, if not better, and they're, and they're safer. Uh, so that's called succinylcholine. Mm -hmm. and it's uncommon that that's actually used, um, but, you know, you never know if you're out, you know, outside of the U.S. or, you know, I, I certainly haven't practiced everywhere in the U.S., so I, I can't speak to every situation. But I think in general, that's a medication that's sort of best avoided for, for patients with neuromuscular disease, succinylcholine. Okay. And then what about other medications that should be avoided before, during, and after surgery, things like um, sedating medications or medications that could suppress respiratory drive. Right. Well, um, this gets a little bit into um, the risk because it's gonna vary from person to person. And a person with um, pretty, you know, pretty intact lung function, um, you know, some of these medications are unlikely to have a big effect, but for people with a low lung function, um, they may have a, a bigger outsized effect. Um, the cutoff we like to use, and it's it's purely as like a guide guidepost. It's not it's not a, um, a an absolute rule, 
-hmm. but when the vital capacity is below 50% of the predicted value, we do worry a bit about um, sedating medications and how they might suppress breathing. And those types of medications um, include uh, benzodiazepine medications. I think in general, at low doses, those medications alone don't suppress breathing. We probably worry a bit more about opioid pain medications. Opioid pain medications are things like morphine, oxycodone, uh, dilaudid. These things are sometimes used to manage, you know, severe pain preoperatively and postoperatively. And um, I'm certainly not saying don't use those medications because, you know, pain is important and it needs to be treated. But what needs to happen is that that one uses the lowest effective dose. Mm -hmm. And if there's any evidence of excessive sedation, um, particularly uh, where the medication is causing someone to be asleep, they take the medication and they're they're sleeping or something, that is a concern for opioid-induced respiratory depression. And so um, those medications should never be used to for sleep. They should be used for pain. They should be used at the lowest effective dose. And in patients who have um, more severe respiratory muscle impairment, um, that may include some monitoring after, you know, after hospitals or after a surgery, including potentially a hospital stay. So th those medications have to be, you have to be careful about. And we, we sort of touched on this as well too. Um, is there a standard of care for types of sedation, such as when to use inhaled versus IV sedation or local versus general for individuals with an NMD? Yes. Yeah, so um, again, for patients who are at risk for malignant hyperthermia um, by nature of their specific neuromuscular disease, and it's really, it's not all neuromuscular diseases. It's certain, it's certain ones, it's ones that typically affect kind of how calcium flows in the, in the muscle cells. Those patients uh, should not receive volatile anesthetic medications. Um, but again, that's not every single patient. So it's important to know your diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, and you certainly can ask, you know, hey, uh, uh, is my neuromuscular disease one where I have to worry about, you know, volatile anesthetics? Um, beyond that, um, uh, you know, I think uh, um, those are the, that's probably the main one I would mention as a as a specific risk. Um, I think any of the other medications, um, it's a bit of a judgment about you know risk versus benefit. And um, and again, there are a number of different ways to do a procedure. And so if there's an option to do it safely with a lighter level of sedation, including local uh, sedation, uh, that might be worth pursuing. For example, when we uh, have our interventional radiologists place gastrostomy tubes or, or feeding tubes for the stomach, they typically can do it just with local anesthesia. And it used to be that those were done with more moderate sedation. But what happened is our interventional radiologist got really good at doing okay. those procedures and um, really good at getting really good local anesthesia. Um, so, you know, it's always reasonable to ask um, what, uh, what concerns do you have about my specific neuromuscular disease? Uh, what are the options as far as anesthesia and are, are any of those um, better in terms of reducing my risk. And then, of course, for those that don't have an exact diagnosis, which um, we actually see a fair amount of, of people that don't, um, those they just have to avoid what could potentially be most harmful. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, certainly, if, if you're a total unknown, um, you can still do surgery safely. It just may take a little bit more planning. It may, you know, it may involve a little bit of a different plan than what they typically do. So they need to kind of, you know, plan ahead and make sure that they, uh, that the anesthesiologist um, and the surgeon are confident that, you know, the amount of sedation is going to be appropriate. Um, 
but you know, I think the volatile anesthetics um, uh, aren't the only game in town uh, for anesthesia. There's, you know, IV medications like propofol that can give a very nice deep level of sedation. And, um, you know, it may be it's a little bit different than what they would typically do, but uh, with the right planning, it can still be done safely. Okay. Um, what about personal equipment, specifically respiratory equipment? that we should take along for any procedure. Right, so this is gonna vary a little bit from hospital to hospital. I'll tell you what we um, have been doing at UCSD. Um, what we have taken the position of is that our patients with neuromuscular disease, they're using BiPAP or non-invasive ventilation, that are using off assist or, or mechanical insufflation, exufflation, that we've spent time, you know, adjusting those devices and getting them set individualized uh, for each patient. And so we actually think that patients are better off bringing their own equipment when they have a surgery and after the surgery, um, when they're, if they're being monitored in the hospital uh, or they're taking a nap after surgery, that they probably are better off being on their own equipment. Some hospitals say uh, that that's a liability because they don't know if that machine that you have uh, has been checked on appropriately or you bought it on eBay or or what. Um, it's a reasonable concern. And so they say, you know, you need to use the hospital equipment. And I don't think that's the wrong answer as long as you have an inpatient uh, respiratory therapist or anesthesiologist that is knowledgeable and attuned to the fact that, you know, you can't just slap on any old device and pick any old settings. It's mm -hmm. going to potentially require a little bit of adjustment there at the bedside to make sure that it's uh, supporting the breathing appropriately. So it's, it takes a few more steps for us. We've said, I think it, it's um, more straightforward and maybe a little less anxiety provoking um, to just use those settings that we know work already. Um, but again, it, it's going to vary from hospital to hospital. And so it's good to ask ahead of time, um, what the plan is, understand what you're looking at after surgery. Um, you can certainly always bring your equipment. And even if they say, oh, you can't use that here, you could plug it in and turn it on and pull up the settings. And that could give them a good starting place in terms of translating that to the equipment they have there in the hospital. Definitely. Do you have any tips to avoid complications during and after procedures with anesthesia? Hmm. Well, I think the biggest tip is, as I said before, is, is just planning. You know, avoiding issues is all about planning. Hmm. Um, beyond that, you know, I think um, it's early detection of complications. And so if you've had a surgery and you've gone home, and the breathing's off, um, or you're developing any infectious signs or symptoms, um, you don't want to wait. You don't want to say, I'm just going to wait it out, and you know, I'm sure it'll get better, and um, I don't want to bother anybody. Um, you know, Every surgeon and anesthesiologist wants the surgery to go as safely as possible, and that includes you know, if there are post-operative issues that try to minimize those complications. So I can't imagine anybody that would want somebody to sit there at home if they think there's something that's not right after surgery. I think everybody on the team wants to know. So that's what I would encourage. Just if there's anything that seems off uh, that you know you're you're on your you're using your BiPAP or, or let's say you don't use a BiPAP but you're having shortness of breath, um, or you know you're having some phlegm and some maybe some chills or something like that you know, reach out to somebody and get checked out. There seems to be quite a bit of anxiety about limited mouth opening and contractures um, with regard to intubation and how, how are those things worked around, even potentially neck contractures that might make our intubation a little more difficult than the, the average person. Right. So, um, you know, the 
anesthesiologists and critical care doctors, we have um, this idea of a difficult airway. And so there are a number of different things that predict difficulty in, you know, getting somebody on a, uh, with an endotracheal tube down into their trachea. And just like you said, those include limited mouth opening, limitations in neck mobility, um, you know, anatomic changes that can sometimes happen, a small, small mouth or a narrow, narrow palate or big tongue. Um, and so those things um, are all predictors of difficulty with intubation and, um, you know, are common in patients with neuromuscular disease. Um, anesthesiologists are well aware of, you know, one of their main goals is to figure out if there's going to be a difficult airway and come up with a good plan for how to deal with it. And fortunately, you know, these days there are a lot of um, solutions for that. There are uh, a lot of video scopes that can be used. There's uh, fiber optic intubation. There are a number of different things that can be can be done to um, successfully intubate, you know, in the setting of a, of a difficult, difficult, known difficult or anticipated difficult airway. Um, again, all the more reason to plan ahead um, so that the anesthesiologist can have adequate time to have a plan. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, maybe we're going to touch on this later, but in, in most, uh, for most surgeries, you know, that includes a preoperative consultation with an anesthesiologist, um, where you're not just seeing them right immediately prior to the procedure, but you're actually seeing them in a clinic, you know, a week or two, or maybe a few days before the surgery, so they can really do have time to do a full assessment, come up with a plan and make sure they have all the tools that are needed available. Okay. What about breathing support um, being managed during an oral surgery? This one tends to come up pretty, pretty frequently within our community. Yeah, we, uh, we just had a, a situation with a, um, a uh, patient of mine with uh, spinal muscular atrophy who needed to have a very extensive oral surgery, and it was challenging. Um, uh, and we ended up actually having to keep her on the ventilator with the endotracheal tube down for a while until we were confident that we could get her pain under good control, that any oozing or things like that, um, that those things were under under good control. Um so sometimes um, things like that need to happen. Um, when someone has oral surgery, you know, using a BiPAP hypothesis can be uh, can be tough. Uh, so again, that's one of those situations where you might not want to extubate right away. You might want to, you know, kind of say, well, let's just be, be a little bit more patient, make sure we're really confident before we uh, take out the endotracheal tube. Nobody wants to be on a ventilator any longer than necessary, but um, you know, when there's an issue in the mouth or in the airway itself, uh, it's often better safe with a protected airway than to uh, uh, extubate uh, um, too early. And then this, this kind of um, feeds into the next question about whether or not there's a neuromuscular disease protocol that should be followed for extubation. Um, there are some folks that find out that the hospital generally has a policy that if, if you aren't extubated back to your existing prior level of function, whether that be with a BiPAP or gone invasive ventilation or without, within a certain time frame, like seven to 10 days, then it's an automatic guarantee that you're going to need to get a trach. Um, so there's yeah. a lot of anxiety surrounding the whole extubation and wanting to be extubated as quickly as possible to avoid right. the potential for, for that, for an yeah. unplanned um, tracheostomy. Right. Yeah. And I think for a lot of our patients with neuromuscular disease, you know, at home, they're very well managed, you know, without tracheostomies these days, we have so many non-invasive um uh, options available. So nobody wants to go into surgery and then 
come out with a trach that they didn't didn't want or you know didn't didn't really need per se. Um, there is no set time at which somebody that's on a ventilator has to get a tracheostomy. Um, and, uh, you know, there are some complications that can accumulate, you know, over time being on a ventilator with an endotracheal tube. Um, but there's no exact time point at which those downsides, you know, outweigh the upsides of waiting a little bit longer. What I see typically when we're having that issue is that um, as far as getting people extubated, um, there's not been enough aggressive airway clearance to really try to get the lungs nice and opened up. And so typically if someone's coming into surgery and they're you know, using BiPAP just at night, uh, they get a surgery and then they're having a hard time getting them off the ventilator. What we will try to do is very, very aggressively um, get their get airway clearance going. We will be very aggressive about treating any hint of any infection, um, you know, looking looking very aggressively for infection and opting to treat rather than to say, well, let's wait it out. And um, and with that strategy, we're usually pretty successful about getting people off the ventilator, you know, within a relatively short period of time. I will say we have sometimes patients who are at another hospital who have been intubated for a while, and they say, oh, you know, we kind of are thinking maybe this patient needs a tracheostomy. Um, we're not really comfortable extubating them. Uh, we'll bring those patients over and we will apply our approach, very aggressive airway clearance, aggressive treatment of, of potential infection, um, and, you know, often be able to get them off the ventilator. So I think, you know, if, if, uh, if there's a concern that, um, that someone is stuck on a ventilator, and not able to come off, even though they were, you know, doing pretty well prior to going into surgery, um, it may just require a little bit of a different approach. It may require reaching out and saying, you know, is there anybody else we can talk to that might have other ideas about how to come off the ventilator? And just recognizing that there isn't, you know, there isn't a ticking ticking clock or anything like that that, that says, uh, you know, if you hit two weeks, you got to get a tracheostomy. It's just not true. Certainly, you don't want to ever have to wait two weeks. I would recommend if you're not making progress within a couple of days or so to start having the conversation of, hey, can we change our approach? Can we talk to somebody else about, you know, other ideas? Um, so you're not kind of um, pushing up on, on being on the ventilator two weeks and being frustrated and everybody's frustrated. Uh, so start those conversations early if the progress is not being made. But there's no there's no ticking clock. Okay. Um, what do you think about having... Um in advance, planned with your pulmonary clinician and written out an extubation plan to share with the team prior to um, the procedure. Is that something that, that could potentially be done? I mean, obviously things change in the moment, but to go in with a written plan, is that something you might advise? Yeah, I uh, when when we see our patients for preoperative consultation in the pulmonary clinic and our in our ventilation clinic, um, in our note we will um, detail what we foresee as being a reasonable plan mm -hmm. for extubation, and some of this is a bit boilerplate, you know, but um, I think having it down there on paper that, uh, well, I guess this virtual paper these days, but. Um, where, you know, it can be referenced, hey, this is what my pulmonologist would kind of wanted to do. Um, and that's uh, often helpful as a starting point for the um, for the anesthesiologist and the, and the post-operative team. So yeah, I do, again, it, it comes down to planning. And again, a lot of this is about, you know, just getting back to the interventions that you were doing before the surgery. If, if you were being appropriately managed before and with the uh, BiPAP and cough assist, you know, getting back to those things. Okay. What about post-operative oxygen saturation levels um, and managing those and potentially um, uh, having the challenge where uh, maybe the individual is not yet on any sort of assisted or mechanical ventilation and there's that push from hospital staff to get them on a nasal cannula with um, oxygen. Yeah. So oxygen, you know, is used routinely in the post-operative setting. 
people without neuromuscular disease will get a little bit of atelectasis or lung compression, you know, there's little secretions, things like that, that, that cause oxygen levels to be a little bit low. And so it's very safely treated in patients without neuromuscular disease with a little touch of oxygen. Um, for a neuromuscular patient, there's uh, uh, two main concerns with oxygen, supplemental oxygen. Mm -hmm. um, one is that if you give very high concentrations of oxygen, that that can suppress breathing. And so it turns out oxygen is not the, the main driver of our, our breathing. Um, but it does have a contribution, a small contribution. And if you really excessively uh, increase oxygen levels, the respiratory drive can go down. I think that's an overall minor concern um, because it's just not that common for people to be put on super high amounts of oxygen uh, anymore. Um, but the, the second concern is probably a little bit more uh, important, and that is that uh, putting somebody on supplemental oxygen will increase their oxygen saturation, but will not change their carbon dioxide. So their breathing can get shallower and shallower and shallower, and their carbon dioxide level can go up and up and up without um, detecting it. Um, if you were not on supplemental oxygen and your breathing got shallow, the saturations would start to go down. And so, uh, so it can kind of cover things up a little bit. So it is a concern. Uh, again, I would go back to the stratification of risk. If, if you're a patient with uh, reasonably intact respiratory muscle strength, a little bit of oxygen, you know, used at an appropriate dose is probably safe. For patients with ventilatory impairment where they're using BiPAP at night and definitely people that are using BiPAP more than just at night, um, covering up hypoventilation or shallow breathing is a concern. Um, so, you know, again, it goes back to what you were talking about before the extubation plan. If you're being put on oxygen um, and the plan was to extubate and, you know, get you pretty quickly back on the BiPAP um, and that's not happening, you know, you need to kind of be reaching out and saying, hey, the plan was to get back on the BiPAP. If there's, you know, uncertainty, um, you can always get a blood gas. So check a carbon dioxide level and kind of see, you know, hey, is is this low oxygen? Is it just a little bit of usual post-operative low oxygen or is, are we sort of covering up, you know, worsening hypoventilation? And every hospital is able to check a blood gas, you know, and get a, get a result back pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there really a, a protocol that we would follow um, a respiratory one for that first week after surgery, or maybe the first couple of weeks, maybe more use of insufflation, exufflation, potentially more use of our mechanical ventilation if we were using it before. Yeah, potentially, you know, um, when people have done you know, detailed studies looking at the respiratory effects of, of, certain anesthetic medications, you can see effects out as, as far as like 72 hours. And so it is possible that there can be some suppression of breathing and respiratory reflexes, um, you know, for several days after surgery. Um, again, there, there's some details on that. I wouldn't say everybody needs to be super worried after surgery, but I think it's a listen to your body type of situation. Um, if, uh, you know, if you're having shortness of breath, uh, you're having lower oxygen saturations, um, more secretions, those kinds of things. I would be pretty aggressive about using BiPAP more often, using cough assist more often, um, and, you know, and not be surprised that, that you need that. And then there's the pain medications thing as well. If you're using pain medications, um, you know, you might need to be a little bit more cognizant about using BiPAP aggressively. So again, I think come up with a plan. If you you know, usually it's not a big surprise after surgery, you know, that hey, there's a lot of pain medications that are being required, um, or you know, it's a big long surgery, a lot of anesthesia on board. Um, those kind of things you usually know about ahead of time. Come up with a plan, and then again, if after surgery you're at all concerned, reach out to your um, reach out to your physicians. Mm -hmm.
So one who, you know, maybe didn't need to use their ventilation during the day before the surgery, maybe for the first two or three days, they may need to use it more than just at night. They may find themselves needing it a little more in the day. And, and that's kind of to be expected, would you say? I think it is. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't hurt. Obviously, nobody wants to be on their machine more than they really need to be. But, you know, it couldn't hurt. You're recovering from a surgery. You know, give give your body a little bit of time. The, these machines, they they support your muscles, you know. And just like you wouldn't expect after a surgery to, um, you know, be back at 100% immediately, you know, your respiratory muscles need a little bit of a, a little bit of understanding there too. And so, you know, it doesn't hurt to increase your use some and just wait until you're listening to your whole body. And as you're feeling more and more recovered, I think you can back off and get to get back to where you were before. Okay. Do you have any final tips for a successful outcome? Ooh, well, again, I think I just re would reiterate, um, it's all about planning. Uh, and so that starts early. Um, and, you know, ideally it starts very early, but I think, you know, we all understand that sometimes things are a little more urgent. And, uh, you know, I had a patient a few weeks ago who ended up needing, you know, a relatively urgent procedure for some kidney stones. And, you know, um, we figured it out, you know, but um, it was a little tough to figure out a spot in clinic and, you know, not and, and keeping the surgeon happy that, that we were going to get everything done ahead of time. And, you know, it's a little bit of a uh, stress to everybody, but ultimately everybody wants a successful, you know, safe surgery. And so, um, so even if, even if it's uh, going to be a, a bit rushed and everything, it's still worth, you know, trying to get as optimized preoperatively as possible. And then sometimes you have to, you know, these surgeries that are sort of urgent, you know, when you really kind of weigh the upsides and downsides, you know, it's kind of like, I maybe mean, we should just push this off just a few weeks until we're really confident that, you know, that you're comfortable using the BiPAP or that, you know, um, that, uh, that we've got a good plan, you know, in place that everybody's comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Maybe a refresher on insufflation, exufflation, if it's been collecting dust in the corner, uh, yeah. get Absolutely. that uh, pulled Absolutely. out and, and practice it prior to the, the surgery. Yeah. That thing is big and it makes a good doorstop, but if it's uh if it's been you know used as a doorstop yeah i would encourage you to make sure that it's functioning that you're comfortable with it same thing with bipap you know we have some patients that are sort of you know very mild respiratory muscle dysfunction they kind of um use their bipap a little more regularly and stuff like that um surgery is a stress on the system and so uh you just want to make sure that um that you're giving your body the support that it needs and uh, once you're through the surgery, you can go back to, you know, you can keep talking to your pulmonologist about what you need to do and stuff. But I think when it comes to surgery, you just want to err on the side of caution and really try to um, do as many things as possible to keep the lungs healthy. Okay. Well, I think you've given us a lot of great uh, nuggets of wisdom here and, and tips. So think this is going to be extremely helpful for our group and I just appreciate uh, you're taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks again for having me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much.